Shout with their shout of praise. See how the giant sun soars up, great Lord of years and days. <clears throat> Check, 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 check. Check, 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 check. What does that mean? What does that mean, Jim? We're going to continue to do this. He needs to be able to learn. He has to learn to give us a hard time when we're live and a cut off when we're done. <laughs> That's good. So we don't embarrass ourselves. Add that to the list. Please. Okay, it's 9 o'clock. Are you going to do your intro? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Margaret's Church. Thank you very much for being here today. And uh, we are thrilled to be able to be live streaming with you wherever you might find yourself in your house, at your kitchen table, uh, wherever it is that you're watching us today. Thank you very much for joining us for worship this morning. Today we have a real treat. We have the Padickery Point crew joining us for worship today. We have Kathy Polk, who will be lecturing, and Ann Sessions, who will be doing the cantering today. Uh, the musical direction of Jim Douglas. And again, thank you to Jim Weekly, who is back on the soundboard, bringing us all directly to you. So, uh, without further ado, we're going to begin. Feel free to comment as you go along, as long as there's a positive comment. We don't want any negativity <laughs> today. We just don't, all right? So, zip it. So, um, feel free to comment. Talk about what you're hearing. And if that is too distracting for you, you can always put a piece of paper up on your screen to you know, not have to read the comments, because people have said it's like people talking in church, and I get that. So, um, so again, comment, don't comment, but also 
take part in the liturgy. What we're doing today is for you, and we've actually included a special prayer to take the place of the post-communion prayer that we normally use. It's a prayer of spiritual communion, which essentially is a prayer that talks about the ways in which we are able to commune spiritually, even though we might not presently be able to physically receive the sacrament of Christ in bread and wine. Uh, we are able to commune spiritually with all the faithful all around the world. So it's an important thing to consider this time. You'll hear that prayer after communion today. All right. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jim and we will get started. Thank you very much. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed, blessed be God's, God's kingdom, kingdom now, now and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading.
A reading from the book of Judges. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. So the Lord sold them into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in the Herosha Hagoyim. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron and had oppressed the Israelites cruelly 20 years. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Lapida, was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites came to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, son of Abunam, from Kedesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take positions at Mount Tabor, bringing 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulun. I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the Wadi Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm this morning is Psalm 123. To you I lift up my eyes, to you enthroned in the heavens. As the eyes of the servant look to the hand of their masters, and the eyes of the maid to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God until he shows us his mercy. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy, for we have more than enough of contempt. Too much of the scorn of the indolent rich and of the derision of the proud. <clears throat> The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory Praise to you, Lord Christ. 
Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven will be as when a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, and each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made you five more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have given what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Like this. The Israelites do what is wrong in the sight of God, and then God delivers them into the hand of an oppressor, a foreign king usually. And then the Israelites cry out in misery, and then God sends a judge to deliver them from their oppression. Repeat, right? So this cycle goes on and on. And here in the first part of Judges, we're in Judges 4 right now, um, it's fairly benign. Right? We get to Judges 10, the 10th chapter, the judges really start to go downhill in terms of their effectiveness and, frankly, their morality. So every chapter begins with, um, this judge did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So it wasn't necessarily the people that were doing the evil, it was their leaders who were forgetting their place in God's kingdom and doing what was evil in God's sight. But I want to talk about this particular chapter because why do we get it? Why is this appointed for, you know, the end of ordinary time? We're coming up to Advent in two weeks. Why do we get this strange one-off story from a book that we really don't read the rest of the year? Here's the thing. The Israelites did what was wrong in the sight of the Lord. So God delivered them into the hand of Jabin, who was this evil king, right? And Jabin's commander was named Sisera, right? And so the Israelites were under that oppression. God then delivered a judge because the Israelites cried out. God delivered a judge named Deborah, right? Now, the word judge isn't necessarily somebody who just arbitrates and somebody who decides right from wrong, although that is a big part of what they do. A judge in this terminology is really more considered a leader of the people, right? Uh, maybe not a president, maybe not a governor, but somebody who is endued with moral authority, right? So they are essentially the moral compass of the people. They are supposed to dictate right from wrong. They are supposed to kind of tell people, hey, this is what you need to be doing, right? So remember, Deborah was a prophetess. And she sat under a tree. And so you think about a prophetess sitting under a tree, telling people right from wrong, saying, this is what God wants you to do. This is the road that God offers you. And we hear that all the time from other prophets in the Bible. We hear it from Amos. We hear it from Jeremiah. We hear it from Isaiah. 
Um, we have Deborah today. Not necessarily telling people what was right or wrong, but here's what happens with this story. Deborah essentially says um, to Barak, who is a, a commander in the, the Israelite army, go and fight Sisera, and God will deliver Sisera into your hand. So Deborah tells Barak to go and do this. And that's what happens, of course, right? Because God delivers his people. But here's the thing. Later on in the story, Sisera goes to a house that he doesn't know where it is. It's, uh, it's owned by Jael, who is a female, another female character in Judges. Jael is a cold-blooded assassin. She kills Sisera, right? And essentially is the deliverer. Of, of the Israelite nation in this story. So who really is the judge? Is it Deborah? Is it the, the prophetess? Is it Deborah? Or is it um, Barak, who is the commander of the army, who actually does the work? Or is it Jael, who is the assassin, who finishes the work? That's the fascinating thing about this story from Judges, is that we don't really know who the judge is. But think about this. Think about who your judge is. Who is your judge? Who is your moral compass? Where do you get that from? Who tells you what's right and what's wrong? Who offers you a path to walk down that you feel is right and good? For a lot of us, it's our own conscience, right? It's that voice in our head that says, hey, Peter, I don't really think that you should be doing this. Peter, this is wrong. Peter, this is going to lead to ruin. Right? That voice comes from ourselves. So I find it fascinating that people rebel against a God as judge and say, oh, you know, God can't judge me for this because we do a really excellent job of judging our own selves. And we usually do not judge with mercy. We don't judge with mercy. And I think the fascinating thing about this story is that not only do we not really know who the true judge is, but we also have these two kind of frameworks battling with each other. On the one hand, you have a framework in which God is the master mover and the manipulator, right? God is the one pulling the strings. God is the one who delivers Israel into the hand of a foreign king. And then God is the one who hears the cries, and God is the one who sends the deliverer. God does all this stuff. And we might think, well, wait, am I being manipulated? Are we under control of some kind of cosmic structure that we're just kind of playing the part out we get another framework in this story though we get the framework of the people of israel and i think this is where we fit in because in judges it follows a pattern right the people do what is wrong in the sight of god god gives them into the hand of an oppressor puts them in danger right and then god hears their cries and then God sends a deliverer. Where's our choice in that? Where is our freedom of will? I think about the idea of a judge as kind of a moral compass. The idea of telling us what's right from wrong. And, you know, you get to a point to where you don't really need that as an individual. But as a community, we know that we need that all the time. We needed Susan B. Anthony to call us on the inequality of not giving women the vote. We needed Martin Luther King Jr. and others to call us on the inequality that was present to say, you know, these Jim Crow acts and, and the Voting Rights Acts are important to achieving some measure of equality. We need these prophets throughout history to call us into a greater moral certitude. So we are not that far away from the Israelites, doing what is evil in the sight of God, and then God sending bad stuff to us, and then raising up a prophet to deliver us. And I think about where we are now, we're what, November, we're seven, eight months into this pandemic in the U.S., really, and we shut down the middle of March, the end of March, I suppose, and we still don't get it. It's still lost on, 
I would say, the majority of the population. When you look at the map, the entire middle of the country and parts of each coast are red with COVID cases. And I don't think there's any cosmic punishment at play. I think it's just our own stubbornness. You know, it's, it's our own stuff that we're doing to ourselves, right? So if you smoke for 50 years, you can't blame God for lung cancer, right? And that's essentially what's happening, is that, is that when we do things to ourselves that we know are wrong, when we choose our individual freedom over common good, you know, essentially choosing our own selfish ways over what might be better for others. The punishment doesn't come from God. It just comes from logic. Right? It, it just happens that way. That when you lead a life of selfishness, the punishment isn't coming from some great being in the sky. It's just the way the world works. When you live for yourself, where are others for you? And I guess I sit with that in a really solemn way this week because it's so incredibly frustrating to hear people say, I wish we could do this. I wish we could do that. I wish we could have this again. I wish I could do this again. Because we had that choice several months ago. And from what I'm told, from what I understand, if we had chosen as a community to take steps towards bettering the situation at the time, the fall might have been saved. And our kids might be in school. Right? The punishment comes from ourselves. It comes from the things that we are willing to do and that we're not willing to do. It comes, frankly, from a sense of self above community. And as Christians, as people who are rooted in the way of Jesus. You know, one of the main tenets of that teaching is to live for others. To lay down your life for others. To sacrifice your well-being for others. When we do those things, we live Granted, I'm, I might not, you know, have a million-dollar mansion, and I might not achieve all the glory for myself, but the world is made better. When I live my life for you, we both live well. When I just live my life for myself, and you live for life for yourself, I think we're judged by that. And the judgment doesn't come from God necessarily, it just comes from the world. We're apart. We're separate. We're not together. If there's one thing that I believe in with every fiber of my being is that we are stronger together. We're stronger when we live for each other. So this reading from Judges comes for me at a really opportune time because it's a kick in my pants to tell me, hey, Peter, there's nothing that God is going to judge you for that you're not already being judged for in the world. There's no punishment that's going to come from God that's going to be worse than what you're experiencing right now, right? When you live for others, you live. If you choose to go it alone, it's just not God's way. Amen. And now let us confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. 
for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became the part of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. She has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead. In the life Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit and give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. O Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, Look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls. And to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Creator God, life is your gift to us. Through baptism, you invite each of us to share the gift of life in service to others. Hear our prayers as we strive to be good stewards. Open the minds and hearts of the people of our parish so that we may accept your challenge to use all our gifts in service to you and in communion with one another to build your kingdom on earth. Make us keenly aware of all the blessings of our rich lives. Help us to be good stewards of our time by putting prayer first in our lives. Help us to be good stewards of our talent by putting ourselves at the service of each other. Help us to be good stewards of our treasure by sharing our financial means to build up our church and to aid those in need. Make your love the foundation of our lives. May our love for you express itself through our eagerness to use our time, our talent, and our treasure to serve you, your church, and one another. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God and to our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways 
to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace, Kathy, Jim. All right. So, thank you very much for being here today. Everything good so far? Good? All right, terrific. Thank you. A um, couple of quick announcements to make, one of which I mentioned during the sermon is that Advent is coming up in two weeks. I know it's hard to believe, but I turned on my radio this morning and I think I heard, um, heard a song by Styx that I didn't like, and then I heard um, a Christmas carol. And I thought, yeah, two weeks till Advent, not, not ready yet. And some of you are already, some of you have your tree up already, I think, which is nuts. Um, anyway, Advent's coming in two weeks. We have a couple things planned. Already we've gotten some Advent wreaths in the other room, right? We do. We have Advent. I don't, can you, am I in the shot, Jim? Um, we have Advent wreath kits in the narthex. And so you can pick up a wreath, and there's a bag that has the candle holders and the candles, and we've got a couple dozen of them. So please help yourself. And I believe that uh, we've got a number of things happening for adult formation during Advent. One of which is Advent Word, which is going to take place on our Instagram account, ST Margaret's Annapolis, one word. And then on Monday nights, I believe David Allen is doing something, yeah? He is. What are we waiting for? There'll be a Bible study. So that'll be Monday nights for the four weeks of Advent. It should be great. So yeah. join us for that. If you're not already in the Monday night group, email me and I'll get you in, uh, I'll get you in to the group. Yeah, and please, if you are from away, you don't have to live in Annapolis to take part in that Monday night thing. That is a virtual thing all over the world. If you're in California, get out of work early, 4 o'clock, you can make it. Uh, if you're in Arizona, you can do it that way too. If you're in Europe, uh, it'll be a later night thing, but it's worth it, all right? So email Patty for more information about David Allen's Monday night thing. Uh, the other thing that I'm excited about is on Wednesday night, we're going to be premiering uh, a Zoom conversation between Andy Engstrom and myself on um, themes of Advent in Marvel movies. So a few of the things we'll be looking at are Doctor Strange, I think we're looking at Guardians of the Galaxy, and a couple other things, uh, themes like hope, found family, deliverance, things like that. So that's another thing to look forward for Advent. The other thing is I believe Jim is looking at, come on Jim, Jim Douglas everyone. What date is that again? All right, thank you. Next Sunday, the 22nd, 4 p.m. And then don't remember, uh, don't forget rather, Advent Lessons and Carols is coming up on December 5th, yes? 6th. Okay, 6th. And uh, that's an annual thing that we do here at St. Margaret's. It'll be different this year, obviously, but I still think it's going to be a worthwhile adventure for us to experience as we work our way towards the journey of Advent. All right, I think that's all I want to talk about, yeah? All right. Thank you for giving. Um, if you have not given yet, if you have not made a pledge yet, please consider doing so. You can always text S give SMC to 73256, the number in your bulletin, um, to make a gift to St. Margaret's Church. Keep our ministry going. Keep your discipleship going, all right, by giving uh, your gifts to God. And again, oh, Jim's got one more thing. They couldn't hear, they couldn't hear Jim. You want to hear Jim. Yes, Thank okay. you for putting in the comments. You couldn't hear me. <laughs> Here we go um, again. So, second time. Um, this, coming sun, uh, ne this coming next Sunday, uh, November 22nd, um, we'll be having a special Thanksgiving-themed hymn sing, um, emceed by Sarah Westcott with me at the organ, and we'll uh, do it live here over Zoom from the sanctuary. Um, you'll receive information in the upcoming Dragon Tales this week with a link to a PDF and a link to the, uh, the Zoom link. Um, so stay tuned for info on that. Um, as Peter had said, he had heard uh, a Christmas carol in the car this morning, and even before we get to Advent, we still have Thanksgiving. And I think of all years, um, we have a lot to be thankful for uh, this Thanksgiving. So stay tuned for info on that.
Yes. November 22nd, 4 p.m. Hymns of gratitude are always welcome. Uh, and I'm always thankful for all of you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Jim. Jim and Ann and Patty and I are uh, raising it up today, but we feel you at home. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll move into communion right now. Thank you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift them, them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days, you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him, you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me.
Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember, we remember his, his death, death. We, we proclaim, proclaim his resurrection, we await God's, God's coming, coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with Mary, Margaret, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray together. Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God of promise, you have prepared a banquet for us. Happy are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. These are the gifts of God. You are the people of God. Take these gifts in remembrance that Christ lived and died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. And now our prayer for spiritual communion. Let us pray together. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things. And I, and I desire, desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you are already there, and unite, and unite myself, myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. alleluia.